Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. yes. I can not to myself. <laughs> okay, let's start. Um, hi, everyone. This is Edith Pugja from Peru, Tech Evangelist at Percona, and CNCF Ambassador, Docker Capian. I moved UK the last year with a Global Talent Visa, and I also contributed to translate Kubernetes website from English to Spanish. I will talk today about Kubernetes operators, but let's start with a little bit of history. Eight years ago, CoreOS introduced the operator framework. The operator framework is an open source toolkit for Kubernetes native ah. application called operators. <laughs> with that time, this gained traction. Why? Because with the excellent way how we can manage complex Kubernetes applications in an effective, automated, and scale scalable way. How Kubernetes with the operators works? We have the control loop, which is the core concept in Kubernetes. The control loop observes the state of the cluster, well, compare it to the desired state, define it by a user, and take the actions to reconcile these differences. Then we have the user that creates a Kubernetes resource, or default resource, also called as a deployment, and we have the YAML file that specifies the desired state and, uh, for the deployment resource. The deployment is deployed in the Kubernetes cluster, and the control loop entering action to match this current state of the cluster with a YAML desire, or with YAML desire. But what happens now if we want to scale our application, make, sh make some ch changes, set secrets, and environment variables? We will need to create new Kubernetes resources or edit the existing ones. So we need to add something and change, so change something with it, which, it, which it looks like, like a lot of work. Now let's see how Kubernetes with operators works. We, ha we have the same control loop. For this, we need operator like Salco Manager, or also called OLM. The OLM is part of the operator framework, which is a set of tools designed to manage the life cycle of the Kubernetes operators. Now we install the operator, which has two parts, the custom resource definition and the controller. The custom resource is where we define the behavior for the new Kubernetes object. And the controller is similar to the control loop, but acts over the custom control definition. Let's say that we want to deploy a custom application. Instead of running multi multiple objects, deployment, secrets, pods, or services, we need just a single file for a single resource. And we deploy that single resource in the cluster. And the operator takes over that. The operator interprets the custom resource definition and start to create the objects. Also, the operator manages the control loop and monitors the state for all the application. This is definitely a better approach to managing complex application in Kubernetes, because as an end user, we need just to worry about a main custom resource. We can use Kubernetes operators for stateless or stateful applications. But more and more people now are using them for a stateful application. This is the case of the databases. Running database in Kubernetes cluster over time is challenging, especially when we talk about the day two of the Kubernetes application life cycle, when we need constantly to optimize the application. There are many operators in, uh, over there for different categories, and they are all in operator hub. This is similar to Docker, Docker Hub. You can find operators for databases, monitoring, security, storage, and most of them are certified by Red Hat uh, OpenShift. How do I crea create my operator? The operator framework provides an SDK to build your operator and instructions also for certified this as well. The operator framework also indicates how to reach each capability model in our operator. A capability model indicates the maturity of our operator from level one to level five. For example, here, the database, for, uh, database operator for MySQL, the maturity is the number four. If you're curious about operators for databases, check our open source Percona Kubernetes operators for MySQL and also Percona Everest that gives you a graphical user interface to create database Kubernetes cluster. And see you at KubeCon where we are raffling this Lego, Lego in the boot F17 in Percona. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Rocked, 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 rocked. Absolutely amazing. Um, also, 
is, is anybody else accustomed to doing a talk in a second language or a third? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's hard. So let's give her another round of applause for that, too. That fucking rocked. Good. Next up, we have Joao. Do we have you? Very good. He's going to be joining us to speak about Cell and uh, all things wonderful there. So that being said, is anybody is anybody's first time at Rejects? Raise your hand. All right. Wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's fucking cool. All right, good. Um, do you think you'll be repeating? Raise your hand if you're going to repeat. I want to see the same show of hands. And more good. All right, we'll be seeing everybody in Salt Lake City then or in KubeCon next year. Spoiler, I heard KubeCon next year in Europe is going to be in London. I, I know, I was waiting for that. <laughs> waiting for that. Good job. Not in Europe, but somewhere. That being said, Joao, stage is yours. Go for it. Um, hello. Um, I will talk about CEL or CEL um, and how it can help you. Um, first, sorry for my bad English. Um, it's a joke for <laughs> a partner. Um, who am I? Um, I'm John Brito. Uh, it's like John. Um, you can find me as um, this Ahoba. Um, and we do a um, podcast in Portuguese mostly um, for Brazilian community. Uh, I'm the Palestrina in CTO of Kubernetes and, and Distro. Um, okay, um, so Kubernetes isn't secured by d default. Um, a lot of people already say this here um, today and yesterday. Um, so uh, what's the solution? Um, how to do the best, best practices, validation rules, custom rules? How, how do I um, validate all these on my clusters? Um, so. So is the solution, common expression language. Um, it is made for YAML engineers um, like me or maybe someone. And um, we made a playground. Uh, Mark Snowball um, showed about Cell yesterday. Um, and you can learn about um, from examples and test directly on your browsers. All the hype is here. Um, WebAssembly, um, Kubernetes, Cell, uh, all in just one browser. <laughs> um, and uh, you can use Cell. The expressions is easy. Um, it's just YAML. Uh, you can search for requests like object, um, spec, template, spec, containers, requests and check if it's CPU limits or memory limits. Um, I don't enter this fight of CPU limits. Um, and another um, examples of expressions, so don't run with hood user um, pods running on with some tag or some region. Um, use labels and don't run on default namespace, please. And um, we are accepting uh, contributions. Uh, we, the playground, um, it's almost a CNCF project. Uh, so you can join and send us feedback and join us on this journey. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, join us. Thank you. Yes. Very good job. Well done, dude. Good job, good job, good job. Let's keep it going. Next up, we have a wonderful person. He happens to be 26 years old. Once upon a time, I was 26 too. Um, that was a while ago. <laughs> fact, fact. <laughs> um, but he is doing incredible things at a very young age. His name is Matteo Bianchi. You can come to the stage, don't be shy. He's also, yeah, let's give him a round of applause. All right. When. When Matteo is not doing Kubernetes-related things, he's a vocal coach, a voice coach. He sings uh, heavy metal. He takes Kube train. Anybody, did anybody come here by train, by the way? Yay, cool. Good, that's awesome. Is anybody going to the Kube train party later? Maybe? Yay, cool, awesome. Very, very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, that being said, um, Matteo, like I said, is doing all sorts of wonderful things. And he will be starting his talk very soon. In the meantime, keep up the energy, folks. Take pictures, tweet, share the love. and. It's all you, Mateo.
Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So, I explained Kubernetes to my grandma. How many times at Christmas or in whatever occasion you get to with your family, you get someone asking, hey, what's your job? What do you actually do? This talk is gonna give you some tools to explain, even to your grandma, what's Kubernetes. So, this is me, who I am. Oh, too much. <laughs> this is me. I'm a developer relations engineer at Omnistrate. We basically take your image and compose pack and make a SaaS out of it. Check us out. And I'm a former startup CTO. I was building the usual platform engineering tool, DevX, Kubernetes, all of that. Uh, I built operators as well, so. <laughs> and then I'm a metal me I'm a metalhead, export aficionado, like I used to play in this kind of arenas, which is pretty fun. Uh, and I'm a full stack nephew. Uh, I mean, my grandma gives me a lot to eat, as you can see. So you can find me on all social media as mbianchidev. Check me out. Anyway, one day at lunch. It was around Christmas time, by the way. So I was in Italy, as usual. And my grandma was cooking my favorite plate of spaghetti. And she asked me, how are you doing in your new job? <sighs> and I was like... What should I say to her? Is Kubernetes easy or is Kubernetes hard? I'm almost having a hard time at the moment. So it's either blue pill or red pill. What would you choose? How many hands for red pill? Blue pill, okay. We have a blue pill. So we chosen to explain to our grandma what is Kubernetes. And she already knew about a few stuff, okay? Because I'm be, I'll be uh, honest. I already had this question a lot of times and I get to explaining what a computer is. I mean, we got there. So basically I can look stuff up and I can do calculations and all my stuff. Then she knows what servers are. So they are basically someone else's PC where you run stuff. And then the cloud, they are servers, but they are shared by multiple companies. Very easy. And then we got into new concepts as virtualization. So we turn one server into multiple ones. Yeah, it's like using the same oven to cook two meals. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're gonna go with that. We're gonna be satisfied with that. Then containers, like giving a packed lunch so you can cook wherever you are. That's a good one. Actually, my grandma came up with that explanation after mine. So I, I'm gonna just say what my grandma thinks about this stuff. <laughs> Orchestration, like at Christmas, when she's managing the kitchen, because she's actually managing and orchestrating my dad and my mom when they cook. And then, whoop, Kubernetes. So, like a very famous chef, like Gordon Ramsay. It's actually pretty true. So imagine you have three hungry nephews, you have to feed biscuits to them, and you want to bake for all of them at the same time. You have to distribute these biscuits, but they also have different quirks. So like, Alessandro doesn't like chocolate, actually allergic probably, uh, Filippo doesn't like fruit jam, and I love chocolate chips. So you need a grandma to orchestrate all of that effort of baking and overseeing, overseeing this cookie prep sesh. And this is what you get. So, <laughs> this is a, an actual schema that I designed to make my grandma understand. <laughs> like, she's the control plane, okay? She's in the master node. She's like scheduling stuff, so giving instructions. She's chatting with other grandmas, uh, actually other copies of the grandma, which are kubelet, which is pretty fun to think. And, she has to check the status, so she's a controller, but she also has all the recipes, so in ATCD. And then there are worker nodes, so you have one node in which you have your vanilla cookie pods, uh, actually one pod with the jam as well, because it's uh, two containers in the same pod. I had to explain that. Didn't venture into namespaces and all of that stuff, of course. So you have two pods for chocolate chips and three pods for butter, and those are actually, oh, oops. Those are actually also my cousins, so. And then we got to the Kubernetes features, just very quickly, load balancing, availability, scalability, and self-healing. 
I mean, these ones were a bit tricky to explain, but she's gonna get there. I'm gonna make my grandma become a better engineer than I am. <laughs> so at the end of the day, my grandma asked me, so are you a grandma for your customers? <laughs> yes, let's say I am, let's say I am. These are my contacts, and if you ever need to explain Kubernetes to someone of a very old age, you can share the video. I think we can all agree that was absolutely incredible, so high five to you. After having worked in the Kubernetes ecosystem for quite some time, I've heard different analogies or metaphors, sometimes about a bartender, um, the one in the Kubernetes documentary, Kelsey Hightower talking about a post office, but grandma's cookies resonates pretty well with me, so I want to give another round of applause to Mateo. That was really good. Our next uh, speaker is Kyle. Kyle, can you please come to the front? Um, have you signed up? All right. The talk? Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, D didn't, <laughs> didn't get that far. And also, while, while he's getting set up, um, has anybody ever organized an event before? Is it easy? No, it's fucking hard. It's really hard. I don't know why we do these things. Um, but these, this wonderful event that we're able to attend has been put together by a lot of people, a lot of patients, a lot of deep breaths, um, sending lots of emails, lots of phone calls, et cetera. I just want to give a shout out because he was volunteering earlier at the reg registration desk. But to all the volunteers who participated, can we please give them a round of applause? <laughs> all right. Obviously, massive shout outs to Andy, to Lexi, to Benazir, to all the people on, um, on the organization team that keep bringing rejects you know, time and time again in this wonderful venue um, that we're here at today. But all the other additions that I've been to as well have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it's really a lot of hard work that goes into it. That being said, whenever you're ready, we're going to hear about debugging. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, so I don't have any slides, but a little intro. I'm the Docker Slim guy. So I talk about slimming containers. And I'm going to show uh, what it's like to use those containers. So, so you have minimal container images, right? Maybe you created them by hand. Or you use one of the chain guard images. Or you used uh, uh, Docker Slim. So you can't have one without the other. You have minimal container images, you need to be able to debug them. And that's what I'm gonna show. So with the latest version of Docker Slim, you can debug container images, minimal container images, or any container images, uh, with three runtimes. With Docker, obviously. Kubernetes, that's another one. And then container D, that's what I'm going to show. So I'll start by uh, slimming Nginx. That's kind of a classic go-to. Uh, it'll take a few seconds. OK, I have a slim image there. And I'm going to run it. So it's running, and I'm going to try to debug it. I'm going to use the interactive prompt mode. That's a lot, a lot easier to use. So by default, it's going to pick Docker runtime, but I can pick it explicitly. And then I need to pick the target. And right now, it's also right there. So if I do a less, I see that I'm actually in the Nginx container. And that's not quite what you get by default, usually. So let's get out and try to debug again. But this time, we're going to try to oops. All right. Uh, target. 
are good. I'm going to pick the same target and then I'm going to pick a different parameter to disable the magic. There's this parameter called run as target shell and it's on by default and I'm going to disable it. So when you do that, you'll get something different. You don't see the Nginx container anymore. Uh, but you can get to it the old-fashioned way through the proc file system. Yeah. Right there. So that's one of the um, enhanced user experience benefits you get there, in addition to different runtimes. So uh, what does it look like to pick a different runtime? It's pretty much the same instead of picking Docker as the runtime, I'm going to pick Kubernetes. And right there, I have a, a small pod running chain guard Nginx, and that's a minimal container image. And I can pick the namespace, but it's actually pretty good picking the defaults. But I'll pick it explicitly. I'll pick the pod, example pod, and uh -huh, target. And right there, I have my target. Connecting, it takes a while to create the ephemeral container and connect. And right there, again, um, I'm actually in the target uh, container. And then I can do which and also I can access the binaries. Now if I look at the hidden files, there's a little bit of magic there with, uh, uh, with the binary directories, with the bin, uh, user bin. Uh, wrap it up soon. And that's, that's pretty much the same thing you get for container D. I have a VM with container D. I pick the runtime. And I pick the target. And I also have Nginx running there. And again, it's right there. All three runtimes, one tool. That's it. Oh, good. Well done. Excellent. Oleg. All right. Our next speaker is Oleg, who's an awesome person, who I've been very fortunate. I realize I didn't even introduce myself. My name is Bart Farrell. I'm a freelance content creator. I'm based in the north of Spain in Bilbao. Has anyone ever been to Bilbao? Yes, good. Uh, we have a wonderful CNCF meetup in Bilbao. I'm one of the organizers. If you'd ever like to give a talk, you are more than welcome. Uh, you can reach out on Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we were lucky enough to have Oleg at one of our meetups uh, last year. Excellent speaker, wonderful community person. Looking forward to what he has to share with us today. Go for it. OK, thank you. Am I audible, actually? Yeah. So thanks a lot for coming to my second talk. And let's continue. Well, no, of course, I'm not uh, talking about uh, Jenkins today, uh, second time. I actually want to talk about test containers for your Golang projects. So who does develop in Golang? Who does know about test containers? Well, it's more than uh, one year ago when it was basically one or two hands at KubeCon. So uh, it, that's really nice. So yeah, I work on developer tools. Actually, I'm a serial uh, dev tools developer and maintainer. So every time there is Ignite talk, I have something uh, to present. And yes, uh, test containers has been uh, one of my most favorite tools for API mocking, prototyping, concluding protocols like uh, gRPC. Oh, yeah. Is it? No, it's not happening again like last time. <laughs> okay, uh, so at Gradle, we actually do quite a lot of stuff, not just uh, Java build tool automation, not just uh, so, okay, no, 
So it's not working after all? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and we have Develocity, and actually we do quite a lot of developer productivity engineering, which is all about metrics, etc. So if you know about SRE, so develop, DPE is basically SRE, but for developers, or something like that. And uh, there are metrics, and of course uh, there are tools that are needed uh, to improve these metrics, to automate them, etc. And one of my favorite tools are local stack, well, because I have to develop use AWS, also Microox and uh, Wiremock for API mocking and pro uh, development and test containers, which I'm about showing to you. So, do you want to see more slides? No. And I do not want to show more slides, but you can find them on my speaker deck account. And uh, let me just uh, show to you quickly what we have. So, there is Test Containers website. Test Containers is a popular project which is available on multiple platforms like Java, Golang, .NET, etc. And uh, in each language, uh, it has quite a simple implementation that allows you to just quickly spin up a container within your test, and then uh, you can manage uh, your unit test framework to automatically tear down this container, uh, and uh, uh, all you need in your code is just say, I want this container, this image with these settings, with these ports exposed, and then you just write unit test, and you let test containers to care about everything. Um, so there is implementation for Golang. Uh, it's called Test Containers for Go, and uh, there is quite a lot of documentation. And there is repository that actually creates, uh, pr provides everything around Test Containers uh, for Go. And of course, uh, there is also Go package documentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so there is a lot of stuff. Uh, I will just show you how it looks like in practice. So there is a bunch of models that you can integrate, and some one of these models is Wiremock. And when you develop, you can just say that, uh, uh, is everyone familiar with Wiremock? No. Microx? Okay, so basically it's Microx, uh, but uh, uh, all the one written in Java. And uh, when you do development, so you say that uh, I need uh, Wiremock test containers go. In fact, it pulls in, uh, well, a lot of dependencies, and uh, there are uh, things like Docker client, uh, YMOC, Go YMOC, uh, Open Telemetry embedded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fortunately, everything uh, is mostly for testing purposes. And when you go there, uh, so you just say that uh, I want to run a container and stop on cleanup. It's a wrapper that basically uh, instructs uh, a testing uh, container to tear it down, uh, and then. Uh, everything is provisioned, you send HTTP request, for example, or here's your basically client application code, and then you can verify what's uh, being returned by just uh, calling another method. And everything is being run in a container, so whether you have a database, whether you have a Kubernetes cluster, either a K3S uh, uh, model, for example, with all the capabilities, you can uh, just write like that, and everything gets provisioned for you. And how it looks uh, from uh, testing perspective, uh, so, I just call go test, and well, that's it. So it provisions container, it um, do, does all the mappings, it acquires random ports, you work with it, and then it tears down. That's it, and if you develop uh, microservices, et cetera, consider doing more integration tests with tools like that. Done. Great, thank you very much. Good job. Well done, dude. Cheers. All right, next up, we have someone who's speaking about cube color. All right, ready? Ready to go? Ready to rock? Okay, one, two, ready? Okay, hello, my name is uh, Sebastian Prune uh, on Slack and whatnot, C CNCF ambassador, uh, meetup organizer in Canada, specifically, specifically uh, Quebec City. Uh, I'm here 
I, I, I'm now also the maintainer of KubeColor. Uh, who knows KubeColor or use it already? One hand. Okay, so if you're using it, if you're using it for a long time, uh, the, the old project is now archived, and there is a new project with, which was cloned with a lot of new features in, into it. So upgrade. So now for all the others, uh, most of your presenters who are presenters this year, today, or or okay. So I don't want to see any demo where you tap a cube cut or something and it's black and white or white and black. Stop that. That's disgusting. So that's what <laughs> we're talking uh, uh, here. Okay, so this is the first one is what you usually get and, and I'm sorry for you if you're working all day long and, and watching this kind of stuff in your terminal. And the other one is, well, w using cube color. Uh, I'm sorry, but like I, I totally see there's a problem with some pods uh, right away. I don't have to think or look at the lines. It's straightforward. Uh, same thing when you describe, uh, of course, this one I is very small, but the idea is see, just check the colors. You don't mind. The only important thing is the reason, like crash look back up. You see that straight away, ready, false, like you know it. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to see. So that's a very great tool. It's a single Go binary that calls kubectl uh, undercover. So what you usually do is like you just install kubectl. It will use your regular kubectl uh, below it. So go to the, it's very install, uh, easy to install on, on whatever the platform. For Mac, you can brew install kubectl. It's, it's very simple. You then just alias kubectl equal kubectl, and you're done. And you have colors. So go test it. And, and, and you love it. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will never go back of black and white. Thank you. Very well done. Excellent job. Excellent job, respect to Cube Color, cool. Uh, our next speaker is David, uh, who's gonna be talking about OpenStack. Yes, come to the stage. I will say that this lovely human is by far one of the most fashionable people in this building, so that we're giving him a round of applause. I really dig his style, Fucking sick. In fact, I came to the idea to make this lightning talk like yesterday, and uh, until like the uh, before ten minutes, I didn't even have slides. So it's very improvised, and I hope you will like it. So you know, like this question you get always at those conferences, like, "Hey, how you are? How are you? What's your name? What are you working on?" And I say, like, "Yeah, uh, I deploy OpenStack on Kubernetes." And then people say, "Yeah, you mean you deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack?" And I say, "No, I deploy OpenStack on Kubernetes." So that. I think, like, I had uh, people who were always fascinated, so I said, like, okay, maybe I make a lightning talk about this. Who I am. So, this is me with my uh, more colorful picture, which is also on GitHub. And uh, I work for Sys11, a uh, wonderful company, since 2022. And I actually have been playing uh, with Kubernetes since version 1.3. That's pretty much like, nine years ago. And I started before as a Java engineer. Okay, I tell you a secret. I've been doing PHP before, yeah. So I'm, but it's part of my it's part of my past. So, what would be a good reason to use OpenStack upon on Kubernetes? And we had such a wonderful talk about um, operators, and I feel like OpenStack is probably one of the nicest examples why operators are great. So, what is OpenStack? OpenStack is one of the like um, most complex distributed systems with uh, awful dependencies I could ever example, yeah, I could Im imagine. Like you have like this Python libraries we need for each component, which might differ from one component to the other on the same system. This is a hell. But then you also have, you know, like this uh, the different databases and uh, memcache and you have RabbitMQ. So that's actually something like a really big microservice architecture. And on top, it's uh, something which is crying for being containerized. So that's actually a first good thing to take uh, OpenStack into containers. But then it's still a complex distributed system. So rather than just deploying it with some like you know, Puppet or Ansible or something, you would something 
that is taking the life, life cycle management over time and, uh, in a cycle. So that's something you could do an operator. So what, what makes sense that you start deploying bare metal Kubernetes and on this bare metal Kubernetes you use something which we um, found out, it's YAUK. It stands for yet another open stack on Kubernetes. I just found this graphic by Googling for five minutes. Just don't judge me for that one, yeah? So uh, that's what, how Yahoo presents itself. Yeah, you just deploy a bare metal Kubernetes cluster, and then you have a set of Kubernetes operators, each for one component. So you have a keystone operator, you have a glance operator, a cinder operator, and stuff and stuff. You follow me, yeah? So, and for all of these components from, co uh, from OpenStack, you have this like of a bunch of CRDs, which is configuring that component in a distributed manner. So, and w something what we develop internally, I just put this graphic from another presentation I hold a few weeks ago, just to uh, show that we uh, solve bare metal deployment using, you know, like uh, an operator which operates the CRDs of other operators. So like we have like operators operating operators. That's what we, we actually do. And uh, to just, you know, like um, also make the bare metal deployment working using uh, Tinkerbell. And uh, then we deploy the operator from Yahook on it, and then actually we just use OpenStack then on top. So I hope uh, if you're interested, I can, like, that's the, the, the quickest demo I could uh, show you. It's actually what um, the cluster which, we are, uh, which I'm working right now on. You, have, you can see that they have a lot of parts, like, um, and uh, the bottom top, that's like, like the operator for all components, like you see here, like what I was saying, Cinder, Glance, Gnocchi, Heat, Horizon, you have the operator for the Keystone and stuff like this, and then if you look up this, we have um, components uh, deployed by the operators, some as uh, deployment, some as stateful sets, some as uh, daemon sets, like what is fitting better for the entire opponent. Also we have, um, uh, yeah, we have also like a Ceph completely using Rook. So we use Cinder um, complete with Ceph. So actually, uh, that's all I can tell you in five minutes about w uh, why and how we operate OpenStack on Kubernetes. So just, th that's it. It's great. Very, very well done. All right, our next speaker. Well, he's already coming up. I will say that this, uh, we have one fashionable individual. This individual has really, really cool sideburns. So massive applause for that. I respect. That's some serious effort. Going to be speaking about um, in-place upgrade in Kepi. Hi everyone, uh, I hope you can hear me correctly. So yeah, you should see I just deployed on OpenStack a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, just one control plane and one worker nodes, so you have to trust me, I just deployed it right now. <laughs> uh, so basically, we just need to, f to see the version of Kubernetes being used, it's 1.28.5. Now let's get back to the slides. So. Today we are going to talk about system CZX and in-place Kubernetes upgrade with cluster API. So hi everyone, I'm Mathieu. I work as a flat car engineer inside Microsoft. Uh, flat car is a container OS in case you don't know. System CZX, uh, what is it? In the last release of System D a few years ago, um, a new feature appeared which is System CZX. Basically it allows you to mount an image on slash reacer and slash OPT. 
Uh, what is an image? An image can be a squashy face image, it can be a directory, it can be whatever you want. So this is an example with an actual uh, CZX image with Flatcar ZFS raw image. So you can see there is the binaries folder, the libraries folder, everything you need to run an application. So in this case, it's to run ZFS tools. So this is quite handy if you can't extend your system because it's immutable, for example. Uh, the feature comes with a timer, which is quite handy because if there is a new systemd CZX uh, image available on a web server, for example, uh, systemd sysupdate will just download that file and create it on the system. So, like, so you can manage updates with CZX images. Now, cluster API. Uh, I won't go in deeper, but this is how I can explain really quickly what is cluster API. Deploy Kubernetes from Kubernetes. That's it. You. That's all you need to know. Uh, now, uh, as um, as an engineer, you know that <laughs> um, everything everything is going to be deployed on your uh, provider using cluster API. So the network, the the security groups, and the instances, and the instances are going to use images, of course, operating system. So what is a cluster API image? Basically, it's uh, an image with all the Kubernetes dependencies, the container runtimes, everything you need to run Kubernetes. It's inside the pre pre baked uh, image. So that's quite handy if you have only one version of Kubernetes, but what if I have a couple of versions of Kubernetes to support? It means that for each version of Kubernetes, I need a new image. Then what if I want to support multiple architectures? I need more images. And what if I want to get new images for each OS version of my Ubuntu or Debian or whatever? Well, it's become, it becomes to, to be a nightmare to, to, to manage. So what if we could use the regular OS images instead of using pre-baked uh, images for cluster API? So that would be nice because we can remove the strong bonding between the Kubernetes version and the OS version of, uh, of, of uh, the system that we want to deploy. And bonus, we can have the auto-updates of Kubernetes because of the systemd sysupdate mechanism. So the current state of this feature is that it's already available on OpenStack Cluster API provider. It's already available on the Azure provider and AWS vSphere uh, are, are, are going to follow. So let's go back to our cluster. We can see that while I was talking, the, um, the, the nodes have been updated to 1.28.7 without doing, no, doing nothing. So the CISX, uh, systemd sysupdate services has been pulling the images and then we have the uh, Kubernetes uh, reboot daemon that has been able to coordinate the reboot. Uh, but yeah, we have in place update with Kubernetes and Cluster API. Thank you. Very well done. Very well done. Our uh, second to last speaker is Francois. You're here, there, you're there. Very good. He's going to be talking about searching 40 petabytes of data for, of storage for uh, logs and metrics, I believe. Very good. Is the sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about like searching like a lot of logs on your cluster. Uh, I hope you don't have this kind of issues because it's very painful, even if you have a, a good engine. Um, who am I? I'm one of the co-founder of Quickwit. Quickwit is a new engine like clone native for logs and traces, and uh, so I work mainly on the engine and also on the Grafana data source so that you can play uh, with the data in it. So first question, uh, why would you want to start a new, uh, a new engine? Um, typically, uh, you want to be able to scale from up, up to petabytes or more generally to uh, terabytes. When you, when you handle or manage or manage logs, it can uh, add up quick, quickly. So that's uh, one pain point. Also, you want uh, to manage this very simply. And lastly, you want to be fast. So we build a new engine from scratch to fix 
boost three pain points. Uh, we build it in Rust. Uh, it's powered by um, a well-known uh, search library, which is used by, by many big companies called TonTV. Uh, to uh, to play with petabytes, you have to uh, decompose computer storage. So we did that. Uh, all the components are stateless, and also uh, as a nice uh, to have, we uh, we also have a schemaless uh, indexing, so you don't have to to uh, to take care about uh, your your schema. So how does it work? First, you have to decouple uh, compute and storage. So on the left part, you are indexing. You, if this is the right path, you are indexing data. And you have one pod. You can start with one pod, but you can add others. This pod will just produce what we call split files. This is the unit of search in QuickWit. And they will just put it, upload it on the object storage. And once it's uploaded, it will also update a small file called the metastore.json file. It's just a list of all the split files that are present on the on the object storage. And then you're done. And on the on the read path, you you have the searchers who can who can have access to this, and you can also add many searchers on it. And then here you have a decoupled computer storage uh, architecture. And you can scale up, scale down your indexers, your searchers, shut down everything, or start everything in one second, or a bit more. Um, the, secret, the secret of, of QuickWit is uh, relies in the QuickWit in the split file. Uh, the split file is made of three data structure. Uh, one data structure is for accessing document from their document ID. This is what we call the doc store. Then we have the inverting index. So this is for the search path. So it's basically a hash map. You have got a term, and we will, it will return the list of documents matching uh, this term. And lastly, we have also columnar storage. It's for uh, analytics purposes, so you can do fancy stuff also with it. And uh, the last part, the small, the tiny part is a hot cache. It's a kind of index of indexes. So you, we, we store a bit of metadata so to access the object storage uh, very fast. And with that, you can search 40 petabytes. So obviously, uh, it's not me playing with uh, this data. We have a, a client called Binance, and they 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 program to to reach like 100 petabytes soon. So uh, as I'm talking, I hope that they they are above uh, 40 40 petabytes, and uh, uh, just they have one cluster, for example, for indexing. Uh, so they can decouple also the clusters for indexing and searching. So here, for example, they isolated like one cluster for indexing. They have 200 pods, and they are indexing at one petabyte per day. So that's, it's, it's possible to build an engine like this, and it's possible to make it work at this scale. And we hope like to, uh, to increase this scale uh, very soon with them. And, and that's it. Well done. Excellent. Good job, Francois.